Oh Lord, we pray this morning that you would give us life according to your word. Make us understand the way of your precepts, and we will meditate on your wondrous works this morning. Strengthen us, we pray, according to your word. In the name of our dear Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Well, I noted several weeks ago when we first began looking at the first of the seven last sayings of our Savior from the cross, that the final words that someone utters in life on their deathbed, they tend to communicate to us what was most important or valued to that person. This morning, as we examine the last, the seventh crossword of Jesus this morning, I would add that the way in which someone dies is equally significant and revealing. Not just the words that they have to say, but the way or the manner in which someone dies can tell us much about their character as well as their faith. Shortly before John Calvin died, he had written a letter to his friend William Farrell that had said within it, I have great difficulty in breathing and expect at any time to breathe my last. It's enough for me to live and to die in Christ, who is gain to those who belong to him, whether in life or in death. Calvin's successor, Theodore Beza, he was present in the room when Calvin passed, and he wrote in his biography on John Calvin about his death, saying, We can truly say that in this one man, John Calvin, God has been pleased to demonstrate to us in our day the way to live well and to die well. We Christians, we're constantly concerned, I think, about living well. We all, I think, as Christians, want to live to the glory of God in whatever we do. But I wonder if we're equally concerned about dying well, about dying to the glory of God. Now, I know it feels like I think I preach often about the subject of death, but in my defense, I'm a pastor, I'm a preacher, and I do feel like I've been called to prepare God's flock to live for the glory of God and to die for the glory of God. Additionally, in my defense, we are also considering the crucifixion, the death of our Lord Jesus. And when you really look at the whole Bible, the whole Bible has a lot to say about the subject of death. After all, death is the common experience of all people, except for Enoch and Elijah. All people in the Bible die, and unless our Lord Jesus should return before we die, we will all die. And so, Really, the question we all need to grapple with this morning is not just how do we live well to the glory of God, but what does it actually look like to die well to the glory of God? And I think Jesus' last crossword and the manner in which he dies answers this question for us. So listen to what he has said from the cross right before he dies. In Luke 23, verse 46, Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, Into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Not only is Jesus an example to each of his people how to live well, but he's also the prime example, the example of how to die well. He's the perfect example of how to die well. The way that Jesus dies here presents us with a pattern to imitate When Jesus came to die, our Lord, he he doesn't complain in his last moments of death, but he commits himself into his Father's sovereign and wise care. And so, congregation, the way that Jesus dies shows us this morning, shows you this morning, that you ought to completely commit yourself to God's kind care to both live and die well, and I would add, to the glory of God. For that is what it means to live and to die well, to the glory of God. To support this word of instruction, I want us to look at this seventh crossword, and then I want to mention five observations that we can make about the way or the manner in which Jesus died, and then I want to offer us three lessons for how we can live and die well to the glory of God like Jesus Christ. So let's look at the five observations we could make from the way that Jesus died. Firstly, we see that he died victoriously. Jesus cried out with a loud voice, we read. Frankly, that's a very odd and unique way for a victim of crucifixion to die. Normally, if not always, those victims of crucifixion, they would die in utter silence. They would not have had the strength to hoist themselves up on the nails and draw breath to even mumble a word, let alone shout a loud cry. And so this is a very unique way of someone dying 
in crucifixion. If you've ever visited someone on their deathbed or in a hospital bed, for the most part, they probably did not have the strength to shout their final words. You'd have to lean in and and listen to them mumble or perhaps whisper. But Jesus, he's said to have died having cried out in a loud voice. For the sake of illustration, loud voice in Greek, it's phone megale, from which is represented in our English word megaphone. So it's as if Jesus is announcing to all who are present at his crucifixion what he is saying in his last words. Everyone who was present at Golgotha would have been able to hear what Jesus had cried loudly and clearly. And so my point is, is that Jesus, he doesn't die a victim of the cross, but rather victoriously on the cross. And we saw that especially last week in the sixth word that he uttered, saying, it is finished. Both the sixth word that we looked at last week, the seventh word we're looking at this week, they reveal to us that Jesus, he does not die the victim, but the victor. He accomplished his mission. He purchased redemption. He defeated sin, death, and the devil. He does not go silently to his death. He publicly announces his victory with all the strength that he has left. Even the Roman centurion is impressed by the way that Jesus died. We'll see that next week in Mark's gospel in Mark 15. The way that Jesus breathed his last caused the Roman centurion to confess Jesus as the Son of God. Isn't that curious? The way in which Jesus died revealed something about his divinity. And so this centurion, no doubt, he had witnessed hundreds of crucifixions before. Countless men have died on crosses before his very eyes, but none of them died the way that Jesus did. Jesus cried out with a loud voice, and he died victoriously. So that's the first way we can observe that Jesus died. He died victoriously. Secondly, observe what Jesus actually cried out. We can say by what he cried out that he died biblically. By that I don't mean he died according to the Bible, although we know he did. He's fulfilling prophecy in his death. But what I do mean is that he died reciting the Bible. He cried out, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, as we just heard from Psalm 31. This is a direct quotation from his father David in Psalm 31, verse 5. The first five verses of Psalm 31, they're one big prayer for help in a time of great distress in David's life. We're not really aware of the circumstances, but his enemies have surrounded him once again, and he's calling out to God for help in time of distress. He commits his whole being into God's strong hands. This is what David says. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. Now this verse, it was a common bedtime prayer that was taught to every Jewish child growing up in the land of Israel in Jesus' day. Every night, a Jewish boy or girl would kneel beside their bed, and they would recite, into your hands I commit my spirit. They would pray that. Then after having prayed that, they would climb into bed under their covers, and they'd fall fast to sleep without a care in the world. This prayer is probably like one of the prayers you may have learned growing up, having recited hundreds of times before bedtime. One of the teddy bears that Owen has at home, it's what I would call a prayer bear. It recites various prayers mechanically. One of them is the Lord's Prayer. Another is the prayer you probably grew up saying before bed. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And if I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. It's a very simple child's prayer, and yet nevertheless it has biblical origins. Back to David's prayer here in Psalm 31, or to Jesus' prayer from the cross in Luke 23. If you were to have lived during the days of Jesus' ministry, it's said that if you were to take a needle and prick Jesus, he would bleed Bible. Jesus lived with the word in his heart, on his mind, in his mouth. And we also see now at the cross that he's dying with the Bible on his heart, on his mind, and on his tongue. Some of his final words that we've seen are either direct quotes from Scripture or are allusions to Scripture and how he's fulfilling them. For example, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That alludes to him fulfilling the prophecy in Isaiah 53, verse 12. Or, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A direct quote from David in Psalm 22, verse 1. Or, I thirst. That was spoken to fulfill the Scripture that David said in Psalm 69, verse 21. And now, with his final breath, Jesus is quoting Scripture 
once again, saying, into your hands I commit my spirit. Jesus' life and death, they prove that he is saturated in Scripture. And amazingly, his final words from the cross is a child's prayer. A prayer that Joseph or Mary maybe would have taught him as he was learning how to speak and pray growing up before bedtime. So not only does Jesus die with the Bible on his mind, but with this simple child's prayer of trust on his lips. And that ties into the third way that Jesus died. Third observation I'll make about the way that Jesus died is that he died confidently. He died trusting in his father. Notably, Jesus does alter David's prayer ever so slightly and personalizes it for himself. Notice what Jesus added. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. David had addressed God as Lord, that is Yahweh, the covenant name of God, but Jesus cries out, Father. This truly was a prayer that was infused with confidence, I think. If you remember, for three hours, Jesus has been in complete darkness. There's this vast chasm that has occurred between him and his father and their relationship as Jesus has become the sin bearer and wrath absorber for sinners. But now, after he's declared it is finished, we hear Jesus call God Father. Despite his horrible torment and suffering, despite receiving the chastisement of God because of our transgressions and iniquities, Jesus still trusted that his Father's hands were the best place for him to be. Such an experience, I think, would have made many, if not all of us, in this room this morning turn away from God, complaining that God has dealt with us unfairly. But Jesus, just like any child, turns trustingly to his Father with confidence. Father, it was Jesus' favorite way to address God in the Gospels. If my math is correct, Father is used of God 245 times in the New Testament. Jesus uses the name Father 165 times. That means 67% of the uses of Father in the New Testament are spoken by the lips of Jesus. And if you look at just Luke's Gospel, we have Jesus' very first words recorded in Scripture and Jesus' last words recorded on the cross. If you recall, when Jesus was a boy of 12, he and his parents, they traveled to Jerusalem to go into the temple, and on the return journey back home to Nazareth, Joseph and Mary looked around them and realized that Jesus was not among their company. And so they got worried, and they retraced their steps all the way back to the temple. And having found Jesus there, they tell Jesus, don't you know that you've got us worried sick? And Jesus just calmly responded, Did you not know that I must be in my Father's house? It's the first words we have of him speaking in the New Testament. Jesus, he lived his life, dialed into his Father's business. When Christ came into the world, the author of Hebrews says that his words were, Father, I have come to do your will. Now in death, we see that Jesus is still thinking and looking to his heavenly Father. Jesus, he dies confident about his relationship with God. God is his father, and he is still God's divine son. So he died confidently. Fourthly, see also that Jesus died expectantly. He says, into your hands I commit my spirit. That word commit is the key word in this phrase. It means to put something into the care and protection of another. It, it speaks of dedicating or entrusting or making a deposit could very well have been a banking term in the ancient world that relates to the expectation of, of someone giving their money or their savings into a bank and expecting a full return or even a profit with interest if they were to take it back. So that which you entrust or that which you deposit into the bank, you expect to get back fully or, depending on the deal, with interest. With that in view, I think we're to understand that Jesus died expecting his father to preserve his spirit after death. The seventh crossword hints that Jesus believed his father was going to raise him from the dead. Prophetically, David claimed in Psalm 16, you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. The apostles Peter and Paul both preach sermons in the book of Acts that apply this very prophecy to Jesus' resurrection, saying that this speaks of Jesus' resurrection. So it's as if Jesus is saying to his father, perhaps, 
Father, I entrust my spirit to you with the expectation that what you have promised me concerning my resurrection will surely take place. You will raise me from the dead, and you will reunite my spirit to my body. In case you think that logic is a bit of a stretch, just recall that Jesus has already predicted three times to his disciples that he will rise from the dead. He says three times, I will suffer, I will be killed, and then on the third day, I will rise. So I don't think it's too far of a leap to suggest that Jesus died with this firm expectation that his father is going to raise him from the dead in glory and in honor. And so Jesus, he dies expectantly. Fifthly, observe that Jesus also died willingly. And having said this, he breathed his last. It doesn't necessarily come across in Luke's uh, account here, but if you go to Matthew chapter 27 or John 19, where we were last week, you'll see it plainly enough. Matthew says that Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Or after Jesus says, it is finished, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Yielded up in Matthew, it means to release or to submit willingly. Gave up, it means to hand over, to deliver over, or to relinquish. The essence here is that Jesus was in total control of his life. Jesus gave up his spirit. It was not taken from him. The way that he died, it speaks to his sovereign authority. It validates even what he said in his Good Shepherd discourse in John chapter 10. Do you remember what Jesus said about his death, the way that he was going to die? He says, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. Once again, I'll state that Jesus does not die a victim. Jesus died of his own volition and victory. That's what we're seeing here. John Calvin put it this way in his Institutes of the Christian Religion. Jesus let himself be swallowed up by death, not to be engulfed by the abyss, but rather to engulf it. That must soon have engulfed us. He let himself be subjected to death, not to be overwhelmed by its power, but rather to lay it low when it was threatening us and exulting over our fallen state. So mysteriously, according to Scripture, we need to believe that Jesus died willingly, laying down his life for his sheep. He says in his Good Shepherd discourse, I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. How marvelous is it to know that Jesus is our willing Savior. He endured the cross because he wanted to save you. He laid down his life to conquer death so that you would never have to be engulfed by it. For Jesus' sheep, it, it's not death to die because the good shepherd has laid down his life and has the authority to take it back up again. Truly, we can say that Jesus died well. We could even say he died valiantly. He willingly died in victory with the Bible on his lips, looking to his Father with trust and confidence and a full ex expectation of his resurrection, that he would rise from the dead. Our greatest and chief example in life or in death is Jesus Christ. Not only does he die to pardon and to purify us from sin, as we've been seeing, not only do, does he die to purchase us as his own prized possession, not only does he die to be a propitiation, satisfying the wrath of God in our place, but now we see in this last crossword that he dies as our pattern. And so if we desire to glorify God in life or in death, that's going to mean that we need to imitate and conform to the image of Jesus Christ, even in death. And so from Jesus' seventh crossword and from David's prayer that we've already looked at in Psalm 31, I want to offer three lessons for living or dying well to the glory of God just like Jesus. What would it look like for us to live and die valiantly and victoriously like Jesus? First lesson is to treasure up God's word and promises in your heart. Clearly, we see Jesus did this during his ministry. You, you never saw him hauling around a giant scroll of scripture, per se. You would see him customarily in the synagogues on the Sabbath. 
He would open up the scroll and he would teach from it. But once he left the synagogue, he wasn't able to carry the scrolls around with them. And nevertheless, we hear him repeatedly quoting from Scripture and teaching Scripture and modeling how to pray by quoting Scripture in his prayers. And so what we learn is that Jesus, he's saturated in Scripture. He breathed Bible, not because he always had it with him, but he did have it in him. He was able to breathe Bible and was able to be saturated in Bible because he had treasured up God's Word in his heart through memorization and meditation. When Jesus was in his darkest hour of deepest suffering, because he had already treasured up God's Word in his heart, he was able to make use of it to strengthen his trust and his hope on the cross. One of, if not the greatest, weapon that God has given us to live and to die well is his holy word, wherein we find all of his precious and very great promises. You cannot hope to live or die to the glory of God like Jesus if you don't ever pick up and wield the sword of the Spirit. And it's going to be extremely difficult for us to live or die to the glory of God like Jesus if we neglect to claim the promises of God that we find within the pages of Scripture. If you're wondering where you can start when it comes to treasuring up God's Word and promises, start with the Psalms. More than any other section of Scripture, Jesus quoted from the Psalms on the cross. Why do you think he quotes from the Psalms on the cross? And I think it's because the Psalms actually reveal to us a lot about the character of God, a lot about the promises of God, and how to put the knowledge of God and those promises of God into action in very real-life situations. The psalmists, whether they were in good days or bad days, all had the promises and character of God on their heart as they call out to God in prayer. Consider Psalm 31. Notice what David says about God and what David clung to in deep distress. He calls God his rock of refuge, a strong fortress, his rock, his fortress, his refuge and faithful God. Look carefully at the progression of David's prayer here in these first five verses. Verses 1 and 2, they begin with David calling on God to be these things, be a rock, be a refuge to me. But then we see it quickly switch into a firm note of confidence by verse 3, that God is these things already to David. Be to me a rock of refuge and a strong fortress, he calls out, since you are my rock and my fortress. David held on to God's character and promises. Both David and Jesus could say, into your hand I commit my spirit, because they had both stored up God's word and promises in their hearts. And that's the secret to living and dying to the glory of God like Jesus. It's to store up scripture in your heart, to meditate on it, to memorize it, put it to heart, so that you can make use of it in whatever situation of distress you find yourself in. Like David, you can contemplate who God is, you can remember what he has done, what he has said, and all that he's promised to you as a redeemed child of God when you treasure up God's word in your heart. So that's the first way that we can live and die well to the glory of God like Jesus. Treasure up God's word and promises in your heart. But doing that closely relates to the second lesson for living and dying well to the glory of God. Take refuge in God through prayer. That is, you actually make use of, you actually put into practice and take action what you've been treasuring up in your heart. Again, go back to Psalm 31. It's one giant example of David taking refuge in God through prayer. When fear had washed over David, when he felt helpless and weak, when he was overrun by his adversaries, he runs to the Lord for refuge. He remembered that God was his refuge and strength, the very present help in time of trouble. Therefore, he did not fear, though his life was falling apart. David began his prayer by calling out for help and deliverance, but as I noted just a moment ago, by verse 3, we see him confiding in God for who he is and what God has promised to be to David. You are my rock and my fortress. You lead me and you guide me for the sake of your glory. You rescue me because you are my refuge. You have redeemed me. God, you are faithful to me. David didn't just know who God was. David actually made use of that knowledge in prayer. 
By prayer, David took refuge in God, who was to him his rock and strong fortress. If you keep on reading the psalm, it's clear that trusting in God didn't immediately solve all of David's problems, but nevertheless, we hear the psalm end with David exhorting all the saints, "'Love the Lord, all you his saints. The Lord preserves the faithful, but abundantly repays the one who acts in pride. Be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who wait for the Lord.'" When we know who our God is and what our God has promised, then we can remember that we can love the Lord, we can be strong in the Lord, and we can wait for the Lord to do exactly what he has said. The very last lines of Psalm 31, they encourage us to be strong and to take heart. It's just another way of David saying, keep trusting, keep running to God for refuge, keep calling on him and depending on his faithfulness through prayer. Is this not what we see Jesus doing in his dying moments? He took refuge in his Father through prayer. He called upon the Lord and called to mind who God was to him. Specifically, he called to mind that God was his Father, the one who would care and keep his promises to his beloved Son. Friends, our dire circumstances will only become small from our perspective when we see that our God is big. And our God is big big. He's our rock of refuge, a strong fortress, and our shelter. To live or die well like Jesus is to take refuge in the Father's arms, and we can do that chiefly through prayer. It's only when we kneel before our God that we can find the strength to stand or to stand up against whatever is assailing us. Prayer is the drawbridge that brings us into God's mighty fortress where we find safety and security in his arms. Now, death can touch us in that fortress, but death cannot sting or hurt us when we dwell in the shelter of the Most High, when we abide in the shadow of the Almighty, as the psalmist says in Psalm 91. And so we claim that promise in God's Word this morning through prayer today. Claim it and say with the psalmist, I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. The final lesson for living or dying to the glory of God like Jesus is to trust your future to God's strong and good hands. Both David and Jesus knew this lesson well. They both said, Into your hands I commit my spirit. Now, we don't know when David uttered this prayer. Presumably, he had many years of life left after he prayed this. On the other hand, Jesus had only one breath left when he prayed this prayer. And so regardless of how much time David or Jesus had left in their lives, both of them entrusted themselves and their futures to God's loving sovereignty, knowing that God knows how to do best. David would go on to pray in Psalm 31, I trust in you, O Lord. I say you are my God. My times are in your hand. My times are in your hand. What a peace-giving reality. James Montgomery Boyce, he elaborates what this means. What times are these? Well, all times. The times of our youth are in God's hands, times when others make decisions for us. Some of those decisions are good decisions, some are bad, but God holds both the good and the bad in his hands and works all things out for the good of those who love him. The times of our maturity are in God's hands. That is, days in which we are, or should be, about our Father's business. In such days, we probably have success, but we also have defeats. Even in spiritual work, everything does not always go well. Does that mean that God has abandoned us? Not at all. The times of defeat, as well as those times of victory, are controlled by God. Finally, the times of our old age are in God's hands, days in which the strength of youth has faded away and the opportunities for starting new work are past. God cares for us also in old age, and he's able to bless those days as much as any others. In brief, this all means that God is present in all the circumstances of your life. Nothing ever comes into your life that surprises God. Indeed, nothing can ever come into your life that is not, first of all, passed through the filter of his strong, good, and loving hands. If you've been watching March Madness this year... You've probably seen a few Allstate insurance commercials. 
where a, a, a feature character of these commercials is named Mayhem. He does exactly what his name implies. He causes all sorts of mayhem to people's vehicles, homes, and lives. He's the raccoon living in your attic, destroying that insulation and the support beams of your house. He's the emotional teenage daughter texting her friend about her, cru her crush who doesn't like her in return as she's pulling into the driveway, running through the garage. He's your blind spot while you're driving on a busy highway, blocking your field of vision of that giant truck in the lane that you're trying to merge into. Whatever it is, this character Mayhem is going to ruin it for you. And then in walks the tall, dark, and handsome actor, rattling off a bunch of ways that Allstate Insurance could have helped you with all of your troubles. And then the commercial, it ends with him saying, Mayhem is everywhere, so call an Allstate agent. Are you in good hands? That's a fitting question to end with this morning. Are you in good hands? Who are you trusting with your future? This morning, I would implore you to trust God with your future. Call out to him in faith. Ask Jesus to be your Savior and the Lord of your life. Ask his Father to have all of his, your times in his hands. If on the cross Jesus trusted his future to the Father by committing his spirit into his hands, then we too can and must trust God with our futures as well. For if God holds your future and your eternal destiny in his hands, then we can be assured that it is safe, secure, and unassailable. Jesus and the Apostle Paul, they were absolutely convinced that nothing in all creation, not even death, could threaten God's promise to lovingly care for every single one of his children. And so if we're to live or to die well to the glory of God like Jesus, let each of us learn to say, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. All of my times are in your hand. I trust in you. For you are my rock, my fortress, my refuge. And you are faithful. Let's pray. Father, we turn to you today in trust, learning from the example of Jesus to put all of our futures into your hands. We recognize that you know how to do what is best, far better than we can. So forgive us when we try to control our own futures, when we try to take the reins and fail miserably. Thank you for teaching us to learn that in your hands is the best place to be, whether in good times or in bad. Help us to learn from Jesus' example, to live well and to die well to your glory, so that whether we live or we die, we magnify your name, we make much of you, and put you on display to a watching world who needs to know you just as we do. Oh, Lord, would you be glorified in all that we do. Whatever we do, may it glorify your name. Amen.